For more than four years, Yemen has been locked in a seemingly intractable civil war that's killed nearly 10,000 people and pushed millions to the brink of starvation. It's been called the worst man-made humanitarian disaster in the world at this time. The reasons for the war are complex. Its roots are in the Arab Spring of 2011, the failure of a political transition, conflicts between Sunni and Shia Muslims, and the war was escalated dramatically in March of 2015 when the Shia-led Iran and Sunni-led Saudi Arabia, with support from other Arab countries, from the United States, the United Kingdom and France, all got involved. Our guest today was born in Sana, Yemen's capital, in his early 20s, he became involved in interfaith groups promoting dialogue between Christians, Muslims, and Jews. And this work made him a target on both sides of Yemen's civil war, so he was forced to leave the country. He's the author of a wonderful autobiography, The Fox Hunt, that you can buy at the back here and that Mohammed will generously stay behind to sign after this session. And it tells the story of how he became an interfaith activist and how the friends he made in that work saved his life and brought him to the US. Please join me in welcoming Mohammed Al Samawi. Mohammed, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It was lovely to share Shabbat with you at Emmanuel on Friday night. Thank you so much. I I'm really enjoying my time. Actually, I'm a guest at the Cathedral Guest House, and it's such a peaceful place. I wish I can stay forever there. But. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's start with your childhood. Tell us a little about, a bit about what it was like growing up in Yemen. Um, as you said, like, you know, I was actually, uh, I was born in Sana'a, the capital city of Yemen. I have uh, two amazing parents. My both parents actually as, uh, are medical doctors. Uh, not only that, actually, all my siblings are medical doctors. <laughs> uh, I'm the only one who was not a doctor in the family, uh, maybe because of my disability, but it's a little bit strange to see, like, all your family are doctors, like a Jewish family lives in Yemen in some way. <laughs> but Yemen is an amazing country. Uh, I remember my childhood seeing other kids playing football in the street. We call it football, we call it soccer. Um, I remember the smell of coffee. Yemen is famous by coffee, and all the city of Sana'a, if you just walk in the city, anyone will see you that you are a stranger. They will come and call you, and they say, come, sit with me. And they want to know who you are, and they will start telling you their own news and their own stories. And I grew up in this kind of environment. But also, even though because of my disability, because of my family situation, I didn't study in a public school. Mm -hmm. I studied in a private school in Yemen. It's one of the most famous schools in Yemen. But even though you need to study the same curricular or system, educational system that you have in the public school, you have mostly five Islamic subjects every year that you study, Quran, the Holy Book of Muslims, Hadith, the speech of the Prophet Muhammad, the Seerah, the story of the Prophet Muhammad, and other Islamic subjects. And also you study mathematics, science, and things like that. But the more that you go to the school, the more you will become knowledge more about the faith, the Islam faith. But you will be less know also about other faiths. They teach you the faith from the perspective of the Muslims, from the perspective, actually, the educational system at that time in Yemen mm -hmm. was mostly brought up from Saudis and Egypt. So it was mixed between the Saudi curricula and the Egyptian curricula. So that was kind of my childhood. I was always wondering, like, in my childhood about why me? Why God gave me such a disability? You know, my disability in the right hand, in the right leg. I couldn't uh, play soccer with other kids. I couldn't ride bicycle. And I was feeling jealous. Why other kids, they can do things while I can do that. But I always th loved God, and I always mm -hmm. loved God. And I was feeling that there's a purpose that God gave me such a disability. But I never understand what was the purpose for that? Mm -hmm. Have and you ever come to any sense of, of a purpose in it? 
it came when I was 23 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I met a Christian teacher in Yemen, his name Luke. Luke, he's originally from England. He was teaching in Yemen. And me and him, we became friends, mostly because he can't speak Arabic very well. <laughs> and for me, finally, I found someone that I can practice English with. So me and him, we became a good friends. Mm -hmm. Luke was uh, a little bit tall. He was always wearing T-shirts, mm -hmm. even though the weather was a little bit cold, but he never wore a jacket. He only wore <laughs> T-shirts. And me and him, we became friends. Mostly, it was kind of like a relationship between a father and a son. In a way that Luke was, and don't understand me wrong, my, my dad, like my dad, dad, he's an amazing human being, mm -hmm. but I can't speak with him about subjects like, you know, um, outside of the box. Like, you know, I can't speak with him about girls, for example, or something <laughs> like that. Luke, I can't speak with him about everything. Mm -hmm. And we, me and him, we became very close with each other. And one time he told me, Mohammed, I'm, I'm leaving Yemen. And I felt sad that, you know, my best friend Luke would leave Yemen. So I decided that I need to give him a gift. Mm -hmm. I want to give him a gift when he will go back to England, he will remember me as his best friend. I went back home, I started searching what kind of gift I need to give to Luke. I couldn't find something until I realized something that Luke is Christian. And back when I was in school, they teach me that anyone who is Christian will go to hell no matter if they are good people or bad people, because they don't believe in the Prophet Muhammad. And that definitely was uh, wrong information. But when they taught me that, I felt really sad about my friend Luke. In my opinion, he was the best Muslim I ever met, although that he's not a Muslim. <laughs> and I decided that maybe now the best gift to give him is that save his soul from hell to heaven. Mm -hmm. So I decided to convert mm -hmm. Luke to Islam. I went to look, I gave him a copy of the Quran, the Holy Book of Muslims, and I told him, if you care about our friendship, I want you to read it. He didn't tell me that he read it before. He told me, sure, I will read it, but in one condition. I said, what is it? He gave me a copy of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And he told me, in the same time you're reading my book, in the same time I'm reading your book, you read my book. Mm -hmm. I went back home, and I want to read the Bible, not because I want to know more, I only need to read the Bible because I want to convert Luke to be a Muslim. <laughs> so as you, can, as you can imagine, when someone reading the Bible like this, he will not read the Bible to know more, he will read the Bible to find the mistakes in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I can go to Luke and I say like, aha, my book is much better than your book now. <laughs> convert to Islam. So I started reading the Bible and I was so amazed mm -hmm. from it. And that moment when I started reading the Bible, it changed my life. It changed my life because I was trying to find mistakes, but more, I found the similarities between Islam and Christianity and Judaism. The more that I would read from the Bible, the more that I would realize that we're all the same, we all have the message. But I couldn't understand why there is such, such conflict between us. I was so lucky that before Luke, he leave Yemen, he actually introduced me to other Christians who lived in Yemen. And I was going and studying the Bible with them in a circle and know more about the Christian faith, but I couldn't find more about the Jewish faith. Mm. Because when I was reading the Bible, I was only thinking that I'm reading only the Christian Bible. But Luke told me that it's actually, the, the one that I was reading mostly, it was the Old Testament. And he told me, Muhammad, you are actually also reading the Jewish Torah. Mm. And when he told me that, I said like, oh my God, I read the book of the people that I hate that they want to kill me. Mm. And I want to understand if they have such amazing book, why there is such hate. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I want to find a Jew and I want to ask them, why do you hate us? Why there is such hate? But I couldn't find Jew. And I was searching for that, so I found something instead called Facebook. <laughs> so on Facebook, I was trying to search for Jews. <laughs> And it was really hard to do that. Um, I was actually writing the word Israel, and I was finding like results from it. And uh, at that time, Facebook was something very new to me. I didn't know even how to use it. So I started actually adding. Uh, we are recording, right? <laughs> uh, I was adding hot girls from Israel. 
as friends, and uh, you can understand nobody except my request. <laughs> it's like someone named Mohammed with like a big mustache and things like that, and he's adding like people from Israel as friends. And then I realized that this is not the way how you use Facebook. Mm -hmm. So I started sending uh, private messages, and it was a typical message. It was like this. Greetings from Yemen. My name is Mohammed. I know that you're a Jew. I know that you live in Israel. What do you think of Muslims? What do you think of Yemenis? You're sincerely Mohammed. <laughs> you can imagine also with such message, like nobody will actually respond. It's like a Nigerian prince, right? Ask you like for a million dollars or something like that. But from that moment, my life changed because people started responding to my message. Mm -hmm. And finally, I found the purpose of my life. I was in this group on Facebook, and everyone started fighting each other. They started speaking about interfaith and how we can come close to each other. And in that moment, I said to myself, that's why God gave me my disability. You see, because of my disability, I learned how to speak English. And because of that, I was able to meet Luke. And because of that, I, I started reading the Bible. And right there, I was in that interfaith page on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's my purpose in life. So I started posting online every day about the similarities between the Bible and the Quran. That's amazing. <laughs> Did you find how that it changed your faith as well, your understanding of God? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, when I started doing the interfaith work, the more that I was reading from the Bible, the more even I was understanding about my own faith itself. Mm -hmm. I started reading more about my faith, Islam, not only from the view that I learned from school, from other views. And that helped me a lot to be who I am today, because yeah. I started being a person, instead of being a person that only want to know that I am perfect, I know for sure that I am a person who I want to change. I want to be something else. I, want, I know that you know, I miss a lot of things in my life, it's like this. Uh, two years ago, actually, I was, uh, I was speaking about what's my favorite dessert in the United States, and I said it's, it's vanilla ice cream. That's my favorite mm -hmm. dessert. And then I discovered something called tiramisu. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not my favorite dessert. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened with me when I started mm -hmm. doing the interfaith work. That I started discovering things about my faith that I didn't know anything about it, and I became more in love with my faith of that. But it's, it's a little bit weird because of when I started doing the interfaith work online, it was only on Facebook, only on Twitter, only on Skype, and I felt that there is something missing. Actually, there was, there was, there was a war in Gaza in, um, I think it, it was in 2012. And because of the war in Gaza, everyone started to be sensitive in the Facebook group. The Muslims started to be sensitive, the Christians, the Jews, and I realized that maybe I'm just doing the work online. It's not the reality. It's not in real person. So maybe I need to do things in real time. But how to do that? I was searching online if I can go to a conference outside mm -hmm. of Yemen so I can do interfaith work. And I saw this conference called the Muslim Jewish Conference. It was in, in Bosnia, Sarajevo. I applied for it. They accept my application. And I went there to the conference. One of the unique experiences in the conference is that I was in the bus going to the conference, and this man near me, he going also to the conference, and we started speaking. But he wasn't only a Jew. He was a Jew, an Israeli, and gay. It's like three in one for me. <laughs> and when I have a conversation with someone that I, in my country, I learned to hate, not to not speak to, mm -hmm. that's what adds a lot to my life. And from that moment, from that conference, I decided that not only doing online activities, but I need to do also activities in reality. Mm -hmm. So I went back from the conference. I started telling my friends, my family about it. I started encouraging everyone to do interfaith work. And that was the real change of my life, because it bring all the problems to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Yemen you grew up in was stable and at peace. It was so stable. Yeah. In a way of that, uh, by the way, I, I don't know if any one of you have been to Yemen, but I really encourage you to go to Yemen. Not now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but hopefully the war will end soon and you can go to Yemen. Uh, the people in Yemen are very, very basic, and they, need to, they want to know more about God all the time. Mm -hmm. They love to speak about God. You go to the streets and tell you people like, you know, how God is beautiful, how God wants to do good work on us. And 
the thing that it's like it's not bad, it just came from the outsider. Um, in Yemen, we never had democracy. We had a kind of like a dictatorship system that covering with democracy. And for example, the ex, the former president of Yemen, he was a president for Yemen for more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. When you start noticing that you don't really have a good educational system in Yemen, you don't have good hospitals, you don't have good schools. So this dictatorship system, they don't want you to focus about them. They don't want you to protest on the streets mm -hmm. that they don't give you the service that they need to give you. So instead of that, they will create for you a fake enemy. So instead of focusing on them, you will fake focus on the fake enemy. Do you know who this fake enemy is? Christians and Jews. Mm -hmm. So anything will happen bad in our country, they will say it's not our issue. It's mm -hmm. actually someone from Israel, someone from the United States, they're trying to change the country. And a lot of people in Yemen, they will believe that. Because you, you hear it from the media, you hear it in the mosque, you hear it in the streets, and then we start feeling like that's maybe the truth. I was one of the people, even mm -hmm. sometimes I believe about it. Before I met Luke, before I started doing interfaith work, I was thinking that really if there's something bad happened in my country, it probably comes from Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But things changed, um, and I feel like this war in Yemen, and I always try to see the positive sides from the bad experiences. And that's an example from my disability, of even what happened to me. I really hope that from this war in Yemen, people will start realizing that our enemy is not the others. We shouldn't othering others. Mm -hmm. We should know that you know, the problem is ourselves and we need to work with ourselves. Um, and I think people start realizing that. Mm -hmm. But what's suffering for me a lot is the people who is losing their lives in Yemen and um, how people are suffering in, because of the war. Yeah, and you began receiving death threats before the war actually started yeah. because of the interfaith work you were doing. Yeah, I mean, when I came back from the conference in Bosnia, I was feeling like lonely, kind of. I know that what I'm doing is the right thing. I know that God is actually pleased with what I'm doing. But on the other hand, I'm losing my friends and I'm losing my family. Mm -hmm. And this was the hardest thing to do because in Islam, actually, you have a beautiful word. It says, Ihsan. Ihsan means that even if people do bad things to you, you need to do always the good things from them. And you always need to wish them the best. And for me, it's that losing the friendship that I had for many years with my close friends. They don't want to talk to me because they think that I'm crazy. Some of them just really believe that I'm an agent for another country and mm. just trying mm. to destroy mm. the society in Yemen. It was the hardest thing. But because I started feeling lonely more and more, I decided that maybe my friends, they don't understand what I'm doing because it's so different for them, so difficult to understand. It's like this, you believe in something for 20 years, mm -hmm. and then one day someone came to Muhammad and said like, oh, actually you were believing about this wrong. Come, I will tell you the truth. It will be hard for them. So I decided that maybe I need to do it in a unique way. I went to a couple of friends of mine, and I told them that, do you want to practice your English? And they said, sure. I said, well, there is a new way of practicing your English. There is an app, there is a program called Skype. I will put you in Skype with people who can speak very good English. I did not tell them that they are actually speaking with people from Israel, <laughs> people who are Jews, and I just want them to know more about the other side. Mm -hmm. But because I did that, uh, the Skype call it didn't go as I was planned. <laughs> um, it didn't last even forever. It was last, just last for a couple of minutes. And as soon as we finished the call, one of the girls, she went to her father. Her father actually works in the same hospital as my dad works. Mm -hmm. And he came to my dad shouting, and he says, your son, Mohammed, is an agent for Mossad. Yeah. And he wants to recruit my girl to be an agent for Mossad too. Yeah, wow. Such accusation in Yemen basically end your life. You can't have any relationship with the Jews. How about you have a relationship with the Israeli intelligence? From that moment, my family was really hard on me. They're hard because they know that you know, I was in love with, with, what I, with of what I'm doing. But in the same time, I was making harm for them, for the reputation of my family itself. So it was a little bit hard of that. The longer that I start to realize that I need to be more careful about my interfaith work, I shouldn't be open that much, the more I realize that I don't have the freedom. 
I don't have the freedom to speak as much as I want about how we are close to each other. But still, I was going to conferences, I was traveling outside of Yemen, I was come back, and that's how I met the people who mm -hmm. helped me out eventually. But later on, I came back to Yemen, I started receiving threats on Facebook. Most of the threats, one of the threats that will speak about it is someone with the picture of Osama bin Laden, and he sent me a picture, he said that we know what you're doing, and if you don't uh, change, we would come to kill you. And in the beginning, I was really afraid about, like someone from Facebook is threatening me, but then when I talked to a person of mine, a friend of mine who lives in Sudan, who's also an interfaith activist, he told me, Mohammed, this friend, he only has five friends on Facebook. <laughs> and I can guarantee to you that you know, this is a fake enemy and definitely a fake picture. And he's just trying to make you scared. And if you are scared, then they success of what they want to do. And he was right. But I never realized that the situation in Yemen would become very bad. Mm -hmm. What happened in Yemen in 2014, there is an extreme group called Houthis. I don't know if you heard about them, but they are very extreme. It's like Hezbollah, but even more extreme than them. They have the disgusting logo, which says, death to America, death to Israel, damn the Jews. They came and they controlled the capital city, Sana'a. And they, when they controlled the capital city, Sana'a, they controlled the police stations, they controlled the army, and they put the Yemeni president as a hostage mm -hmm. in his house. Mm -hmm. And everyone was afraid, I was also afraid, but I said, whatever will happen to others, it will happen also to me. I was working in my office, and someone called me. He was so nice, he was so polite, he said, Salam alaikum, like hi, mm -hmm. are you Mr. Mohammed Ali Al Samawi, which is my phone name? And I said, yes, he said, Mohammed, we know that you're Christian, and you're trying to convert people to be Christians and, uh, to be Christians and Jews, and we will come to kill you. Mm. And as soon as he said that, I started thinking that maybe it's one of my friends who want to make a joke on me, and I said, come on, who's this? I was thinking that, you know, it's a joke, and my friend will say, oh, I'm just joking with you, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. That same day at night, I received another call, but it wasn't a polite call. He didn't say to me, Hello, Salam Alaikum. He just told me one thing. He said, are you at home? Mm. I said, excuse me? He said, are you at home? At the moment, I wasn't afraid about my life more than I was afraid actually about my family. You see, in Yemen, we are family oriented. We live in the same house. I was living in the same house with my parents, with my brothers and sisters. And if they will come to kill me because I was doing interfaith work, at least I did something that made them angry. But what about my family? Mm -hmm. I was only thinking about, I need to be somewhere alone, so if they will come to kill me, they will not also kill my family. So I called a friend of mine, he came, helped me out, we went to a hotel in the middle of Sana'a, he bought his ID so they can't find me, and then I heard the news that the Yemeni president escaped from his house, from the Houthis, and he went to the south of Yemen. And I said, that's it, if I go to the south of Yemen, I will be safe, at least I will be near the president, and the president actually gave um, on Al Jazeera channel, uh, he gave like a speech. He said, if you want to be safe, mm -hmm. if you want to be far away from Houthis, if you want to find army and police, come to Aden. I believed him. I went to Aden to find that the prison is a liar. There was no army, there was no police, but instead of that, there was also extreme groups, including Al Qaeda mm -hmm. there. I was trying to escape from one extreme group to find myself in another extreme group. I thought that, what should I do? Should I go back to Sana'a, to my family? Should I stay far away from my family? But Al-Qaeda actually in Aden, so I didn't know what to do. I couldn't think closer because Houthis came all the way from Sana'a to Aden. And the civil war started between mm -hmm. two extreme groups, part of Houthis and Al-Qaeda, and also the government. It was like a mix of war, and I was in the middle of this war. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was working with an organization called Oxfam. I called my organization, I told them, can you please help me out? My organization told me, Mohammed, we have bad news for you. All the international staff of Oxfam has been already evacuated to Jordan, and nobody can come to help you out. It was hard to me to hear that from my organization to say something like this. I started freaking out, at that time, Saudi Arabia start to be part of the war, which is unfortunately they are still part of the war, mm. what's happening in Yemen, so doing airstrikes. And the first airstrike was on the, electricity, uh, on the power station in Aden. 
And Aden, by the way, it's a very hot city. Like, you know, it's very warm. So you can imagine that you don't have electricity at all. You don't have air conditioning, fan. And I start hearing someone says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and gunshotting, and just like bombing everywhere. I start freaking out. Mm -hmm. And then I see the statement from Al-Qaeda that anyone from the north, like me, anyone who has a Shia background, like me, I have a Shia background, will be killed in the next 24 hours if they will not leave Aden. Now, the problem is, anyone can realize that I'm not from Aden from three things, from my accent. We have different accents between the north and the south, mm -hmm. from my skin color, and also from my last name. My family name is a famous Shia family in Yemen, not, not from the south. So I put myself in a big danger because of mm -hmm. that, and I didn't know what to do. So I was thinking that maybe I should kill myself. Because the pictures that I was seeing on Facebook when Al-Qaeda was catching someone from the north, they just don't kill them, they torture them first. And I was feeling like, I don't want my family to see my pictures on social media being mm -hmm. tortured. Mm -hmm. But I have faith of God. And I know that if I kill myself, God will not be happy for me. So I said I will do one thing, one last thing, that I will post on Facebook. I will ask every single person that I know on Facebook, can you please help me out? And I was thinking that someone from Yemen Someone from Aden will come and help me out. The first response that I was feeling about my messages, someone was sending me a good response. He says, Muhammad, I will pray for you. And definitely I need someone to pray for me, but also I need someone to <laughs> take an action. The other people like, was not, almost not responding to my messages. And I will ask you, like, if you were in the, in the same situation, what you would do? Probably you would do the same thing, mm -hmm. not responding, because you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. The crazy thing happened is that four people that I barely know from the interfaith world started helping me, started giving me the hope, and they said, we want to help you out. One of them, her name, Megan, and Megan, she is Christian. She, uh, at that time, she was living in Israel, and she was feeling so scared about what's happening with me, so she decided that I would send an email to all my friends asking them, do you know anyone who can help my interfaith activists in Yemen? So she sent this email to all her friends. She didn't mention my name. She just said, do you know anyone in Yemen who can help my friend? And one of the people who received her email, his name Justin Hafter, who lives in San Francisco. She didn't know that actually Justin knows me. I'm actually the only Yemeni he knows. <laughs> so when he saw her email, he responded by saying, hi, Megan. I don't know anyone from Yemen, but I met this person from a conference in Jordan, and I think he can help your friend. And he gave her my contact information. <laughs> and she told him, Justin, I am speaking about Muhammad. Mm -hmm. It's the same person. Justin started realizing that I am the one who was in danger. So he was part of the team who was trying to help me out. The third person who responded, his name Daniel. He lives in New York. I met him actually in that conference in Bosnia that I told you about, the first conference I traveled to. And when I met him in the conference in Bosnia, he was dancing break dance. Oh. <laughs> And I was thinking that, you know, how someone with him will be able to help someone like me to escape from Al-Qaeda? <laughs> and he said, I want to help you out. And the fourth person, her name Natasha. Natasha, she's originally from Atlanta. And when I met her, I met him in a conference. We were speaking, me and her, about the, the water issues and the environment. So the four of them, they don't have any experience in uh, Yemen. They don't have any experience in evacuation. And they don't know each other even very well. Mm -hmm. I contacted them on Facebook message, all of them together, and I said, like, please help me out, try to do something for me. So the four of them, and they live in different places, different times. They work as they know each other for a long time. Mm -hmm. The only goal they have is that they want to help me out. How you can help someone that, under my building, Al-Qaeda fighters. Mm -hmm. How you can help someone that is far, far away from you, Everyone, actually, a lot of their friends, they would tell them, like, you know, don't worry about him. Like, you know, he will be safe, hopefully. Mm -hmm. They never give up on me. And because of that, I, would, I never give up on myself. Yeah. And I was always fighting to be safe. Yeah. It's amazing to hear Facebook and the internet doing something that is so positive and so it almost felt miraculous reading your book and seeing the sort of the danger you were in, sort of shut in this tiny apartment, hiding from everyone. And then this international group who tried lots of different ways, but finally found a path to get you out. Yeah, I mean, when you think about Facebook, uh, especially like in a country like Yemen, 
without social media in general, without like you know having a window that you can see the news, be sort of the propaganda that you're hearing from the government, you will not be able to be to be changed. You will not be able to be different. Uh, I was happy that I see social media play a big role in my evacuation, but not only about my evacuation, my activism mm -hmm. itself. Through Facebook, I was able to reach the first Jews. Uh, through Facebook, I was able to contact the friends that I was trying, like asking them to help me out. And through Facebook, I was doing even my interfaith work. Mm -hmm. So social media was big favor in my, in my case. Mm -hmm. um, and even like these four people, like when they helped me out, I, when I came here to the United States, they started showing me all the posts and all the messages they were doing. One of them, Daniel, he actually posted on his wall. He said, does anyone know any way how we can let someone from Yemen escape from Yemen? <laughs> Imagine just the response that he received from his, like from his post. And, but from his post, a lot of people was actually interested to help me out. And they wanted to do something for me. Mercifully, like, you know, by days and days and days, when the evacuation started happening and they were able to contact the military operation, everything has started going together. I escaped from Yemen to Djibouti, to Africa. And then when I was in Africa, they told me, Mohammed, what are, what are you planning to do? I said, I don't know. I only have visa to stay in Africa to Djibouti only for 10 days. They told me, do you want to come to the United States? I said, are you crazy? Of course I want to come to the United States. It's just how? They said, we will try to do something. So they post on social media, mm -hmm. on Facebook, does anyone want to invite Mohammed to come to the United States? And all these individuals, that they didn't know anything about me, mm. they just saw the post on Facebook, start gathering to help me out to come to the United States. And they were able to do that. And one of them, like again, friends, who doesn't know even my story very well, he just saw the post on social media that, you know, Mohammed is wanting to come to the United States, so he contacted Daniel, my friend in New York, and he told him, listen, if this man will come to the United States, I would like to buy his ticket to come to the United States. Mm. And that was very amazing from him, because at that time I didn't have any money. So eventually, when I received the visa to come to the United States, this man bought for me a business class ticket <laughs> from Djibouti to San Francisco. <laughs> now, you can imagine like this. When I escaped from Yemen, I escaped with no luggage. I had no luggage with me at all. Mm -hmm. And when I applied the visa and everything like that, I only have a few clothes with me. I went to the airport with this dirty clothes on me big mustache, um, no luggage, and a business class ticket. <laughs> Everyone was thinking, like, you know, should he travel, should he not? Like, you know, they don't know what's, what's going on. But in the end, they let me travel. When I arrived in San Francisco, nobody was able to come and host me and, like, you know, come pick me up from the airport. And you know that in Yemen, we don't have Uber or Lyft, so I don't know even mm -hmm. how to use that. And again, through social media, through mm -hmm. Facebook, one of my friends from these four people posted on Facebook, does anyone want to pick up Mohammed from San Francisco <laughs> airport? And this beautiful woman, she shared his post, her name Jenna, mm -hmm. she shared her post on her wall. And a very nice man, he's from China originally, he said, I will do it. He doesn't have even a car. He, re he rented a car and he came all the way to the airport with this big sign says Mohammed Samawi. And he doesn't know even my story. So when I saw him, this man came to the airport with this big sign, Mohammed Samawi, I started crying because I thought that he knows everything what happened mm -hmm. to me. And I went to him and I gave him the biggest hug ever. And I said, thank you so much. And he was looking to me with this strange look and he's like, why? I said, well, what do you mean by why? I just, I just escaped from Yemen. And he looked at me, he said, so? <laughs> he doesn't know even that there is a war in Yemen. So I was with him in the car, I was like thinking like, you know, why does he come to pick me up if he doesn't know anything about my story? And he looked at me, he said, so Mohammed, from where do you know Jenna? And I looked to him, I said, who's Jenna? <laughs> she was the beautiful woman who actually shared the boss from Daniel, from my friend Wall. And as soon as it, he knows that I don't know Jenna, he started feeling like really sad and angry. And he started driving a little bit aggressive, like fast. <laughs> And all that I'm thinking about, like, oh my God, I made it all the way from Al-Qaeda and Houthis. Now I will die in San Francisco because of his driving. 
So I started <laughs> telling him my story, like, you know, like, please, like, you know, I just, like, escaped from Al-Qaeda and Houthi and started telling him all this story. And he's like, wow, you have an amazing story. And he started telling me that. He thought that I know Jenna, and he has crush on Jenna. <laughs> And he thought that, you know, I would just give Jenna a call and say, Jenna, he's an amazing guy, like, you should date him. But when I told him that I didn't know Jenna, he was feeling, like, really, like, disappointed that he even rented a car for that. Uh, once I started telling him the story, uh, he started realizing, like, wow, you have an amazing story. And have you ever, are you hungry? I said, yeah, I'm hungry. He said, like, have you ever tried American food before? I said, no. So he invited me for my first meal in the United States. It was KFC. <laughs> In San Francisco, in here, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and you've been unable to return to Yemen since that first yeah. arrival here in San Francisco. Tell us a bit about what your life has been in the US and your upcoming plans, too. Thank you. Um, no, I mean, when I arrived to the United States, I didn't know what I was expecting. I was just expecting to speak in a couple of places, and I don't know what will happen to me. Maybe I will go somewhere else in Africa. I know at that time I will not be able to go back to Yemen, not now at least because of the war. But the more that I stayed in the United States, the more I was in love with the United States. Um, the first thing I was thinking that I want to work at Starbucks. <laughs> I loved it there. I loved that how you can like, you know, give people coffee and like smile in their face. I said, like, I want to be this guy. And I was also afraid. I was afraid to continue to do the interfaith work that I was doing. In one moment, I was feeling that Al-Qaeda would come to kill me here in the United States. Mm -hmm. But the longer that I stayed in the United States, the longer that I understand that the United States, the most important thing about it is freedom of speech. You can say whatever you want to say, you can do whatever you want to do, and nobody will come to kill you. So I decided that you know, I, start, I can start doing interfaith work more and more. I start telling my story more uh, around the United States. And one day, uh, the movie producer, Mark Platt, uh, he's the producer of a movie called La La Land. Mm -hmm. uh, he heard me speaking. He said, I want to make a movie about your story. And then I wrote my book, The Fox Hunt, which is right there. Uh, the Fox Hunt now being translated to eight languages and became bestseller, thank God. <laughs> and um, my life being changed a lot because of that, because of my book. Uh, I'm still missing my family a lot. Mm -hmm. I, it's hard because the situation in the United States became even more complicated against refugees, and especially if you are from Yemen. I don't know if you heard about the Muslim ban, but mm -hmm. Yemen is one of six countries that people can't come to the United States. I miss my family a lot. I miss my friends. I wish if I would be able to come to go back to Yemen. Um, I don't think so. Uh, mm. I became more aware, aware now about my interfaith work, and many people there are not happy about what I'm doing but I really hope one day I will be able to go back. But I decided that, you know, it's great to have a book and someone making a movie about you, but I always like interfaith and I always want to do something about interfaith. So one day I was invited to this um, Jewish organization called Moshe House. It's a uh, Jewish organization that when they have houses around the United States and they let three Jews, four Jews stay in one house and they do events for the Jewish community. And I said, that's an amazing idea. Why I didn't do a similar idea like this? And I have an organization now called the Abrahamic House. And the idea of the Abrahamic House is that we have houses around the United States. We let a Muslim, a Jew, a Christian, and a Baha'i, they stay in these houses for free. Mm -hmm. They don't pay rent. We pay the rent for them. And they can go to their work. They can go to their universities. They can do whatever they want to do except one day a week, they need to do events that gather the communities together inside the house. And we speak about issues that we care a lot about, anti-Semitic, Islamophobia, LGBT rights, women rights, issues that we need to come together to mm -hmm. support it. So that's the goal from the Abrahamic House. What I hope from the Abrahamic House, I want the Abrahamic House to be the look of someone else. Look, when he gave me the Bible, he changed my life. Mm. And I hope the Abrahamic House will change someone's life from ignorance to impassion and you know, love the others. So the first Abrahamic house will be open now in Los Angeles in 2020, March 2020. If you know anyone in Los Angeles, please let them know about the Abrahamic house. I would love to see them there. And my dream is to have 50, 50 Abrahamic house around the United States. And not only that, I hope to have even Abrahamic houses outside of the United States, maybe in Egypt or Morocco 
places that we need to have such houses there. So that's what I'm doing right now. We'd love to have one here in San Francisco. I'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us a bit about what we in the United States can do to help Yemen. We don't hear a lot about this war. And just as you're answering that, if you do have questions for Mohammed, do please write them down. Rebecca will um, collect them and bring them to me in the last 10, 15 minutes. We'll be able to answer some of those questions. First of all, like I, I will tell you something that you don't, you, you probably not know about that, but the war in Yemen has been now more than four years. Mm -hmm. Do you know why it's still continuing until today? Unfortunately, it's because of the United States. America is investing in the war of Yemen. It's actually the first country who's investing in the war of Yemen by selling weapons to the parties who are fighting in Yemen. The Congress, I was working in an organization called um, Yemen Peace Project. It's an organization that we are focusing about how we can go to speak with Congress and senators and ask them, please stop the war in Yemen, and st at least stop supporting the war of Yemen. The Congress and the Senate gave actually a resolution to end the United States support for the war in Yemen. Unfortunately, the President of the United States, he did a voto against this resolution, and until today, still the United States selling weapons to the war in Yemen. One way that you can help, if you want to help Yemen, keep pushing. Keep speaking with the Congress and Senator men and ask or women and ask them to not support the war in Yemen, to not sell weapons to the countries who's actually fighting in Yemen. That's one way of helping Yemen. The other way of helping Yemen is that people in Yemen are suffering, including my family. Mm -hmm. Imagine like this. Uh, <laughs> you wake up every day by a phone alarm. My family is waking up every day by an airstrike. There is no electricity. There is no water. There is no work. People, they can't work anymore. There is no one actually paying them salaries. How do you think the life would be? People are suffering. One of the most amazing things that I saw, actually, when the Muslim ban came here in the United States, I was so amazed by the communities who are not Muslims who stand against this, this uh, decision from the administration. And one thing that you can do is helping the people of Yemen there is few organizations that do good work in Yemen. You can contact with them, you can give them money, and ask them to help the Yemenis who needs there. The most important thing now for Yemenis is food and education. Mm. That's the most thing, uh, health thing. And I'm happy to recommend a couple of organizations for you if you want after, after the speech. That would be wonderful, thank you. What is it that still gives you hope? God. <laughs> God, I mean, I feel like, you know, God, he always has good plans for us. Um, for me, again, as I'm an example of the good thing about God, um, with my disability, uh, you start feeling like, you know, like why God would create someone with a disability in his hand and his leg and never have a purpose in his life. And finally, like, you know, because of his mercy, like, you know, I found that, you know, I actually have a big plans. Mm -hmm. I love my disability. I'm thankful for God that he gave me such disability. Um, and I always think that, you know, from the negativity that we have is actually a good thing will come up from it. Even now, in these dark days, I feel like, you know, we have a lot of conflicts around the world. I feel like maybe that could have good results in the end. Yeah. Right. Oh, thank you. So I have some questions from the floor. Um, what are quotes from the various Abrahamic holy texts that mean something to you and that speak to your interfaith mission and work? <laughs> a lot of things, actually. There is one, one thing that, you know, I loved it a lot, really a lot. Um, it says in the Talmud also, and it says in the Quran, who saves a life, save the whole world. Mm -hmm. And when you read my book more, you will understand that this is actually what happened to me. Uh, just by Luke, when he gave me the Bible, he just thought that, you know, by he gave me the Bible, he will just let me know more about Christianity. He actually saved my life. He saved my life from hate and ignorance. And from that, I was able to meet Daniel, Megan, Justin, and Natasha. But when they helped me out, they didn't help me out only to leave Yemen. There is also other Yemenis who have actually been evacuated with me from the war to Djibouti. So instead of just helping me, they help also others. And it's mm -hmm. like from the phrase, the same phrase of that. There is one thing also that I was always reading in the Bible that, you know, when Jesus was walking and he said, like, you know, don't actually like scream on someone and say, like, give him one shake, give him the other shake. 
And it was that what helped me a lot to be positive in my response when people was attacking me. It's easy for them, for me to say like, you know what, I will cut my relationship with my family and my friends, mm -hmm. but I didn't. It's so amazing because after that, I came here to the United States. I was feeling like I lost the relationship with my mom, my dad, my family. I had a call with my mom and I told my mom, my mom, I just want to let you know that the people who helped me out are Jews and Christians. And I know my mom was a little bit like sensitive about this subject because you know, it was different from her. She told me, I don't care, I want to kiss each one of them <laughs> for helping you. So they changed their life from that. And that's things that I love a lot about it. Uh, but when you just read the Bible and the Quran, and I encourage every one of you actually, be open-minded. Mm -hmm. I called my, fox the fox, uh, my book The Fox Hunt for a reason. Um, there is a very nice story in, um, in the Talmud that says that a group of fish was trying to escape from a fisherman. And while they're trying to escape from the fisherman, a fox saw them. And he told them, hey, I would like to help you out to escape from the fisherman, come with me. But the fish never trust the fox because they know that the fox will eat them. That's mm -hmm. what they learned, and they run away from the fox. In my story, I trusted the fox. Mm -hmm. I trusted the people who I thought that you know, one day they will be the one who actually kill me instead of that they are the one who saved me. And I wanted to know that, what if, what if everything that you have been learned on what if the things that you learned from the church, from the mosque, from the synagogue, from the schools, from the media, is not the absolute right? Mm -hmm. It's not the, abs the true 100% truth. So you need to search for the truth by yourself and keep learning and keep reading. Are you still in contact with Luke? I am. Uh, and not only Luke, but also with his friends also, that you know, I'm close friends with them. Um, when I came here to the United States, I have been sending messages, emails to a couple of friends to help me out because it's a new country for me. And they were so nice and so generous from me. Luke is such an amazing human being. Without him, actually, I wouldn't be the person who I am today. Every day I wake up, I find myself that I want to be like Luke. Like even today, I wear like a, a shirt I'm <laughs> freezing cold. <laughs> um, I always like trying to speak like him. Uh, He's calm, he likes always to, before he speaks, he tries to speak from his spirit. He doesn't like to speak from his mind or his body, he likes to speak from his spirit. And that's always something that I will learn with myself, that I need always to speak with my spirit. Um, I miss him so much, I hope to see him again. Um, but also I miss everyone that, you know, that helped me out and I'm not able to see them. And I know you're in contact with the San Francisco Interfaith Council. Are you working with other sort of interfaith bodies in the United States? So I'm involved with a couple of organizations that do interfaith, especially now with the Abrahamic House. Um, there is the American Jewish Committee, we're big supporters of the work that I do. Uh, Moshe House, the Jewish organization that I told you about that helped me a lot. Um, there is an organization called New Ground, uh, based in Los Angeles, do interfaith work. I am in contact with them to do good work for interfaith, but I need your support, especially that now I'm moving to LA to do the Abrahamic House. If you know anyone, if you know any, uh, any uh, interfaith organizations in LA, please contact me with them. Even not in LA, in California in general, I need these contacts mm -hmm. to do a better work for the Abrahamic House, for the interfaith work. Mm -hmm. And one, just a very small question, um, similarities between Islam and Christianity and differences? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. There's a lot, I mean, the similarities just from the books itself. When you read the books, the story of Noah, the story of Adam, the story of Eve, all these stories are similar. But I think, I will ask you a question though. Um, how many times do you think Muhammad was mentioned in the Quran? Four times. Wow. How many times did Jesus was mentioned? More than 100 times. Wow. There's a lot of things that you actually, when you read the Quran more, you find that it actually came from the Christian faith. You start learning about Mary, you start learning about Jesus himself. And that's one thing that you know, we don't realize about each other about that. But the way how even like, you know, we're trying to do good work in the world, in the end, the resources, it's the same resources. Maybe in the cupboards you think it's different cupboards, but in the end, it's the same core, it's the same thing. 
Islam is came from peace with mind. That's actually the resource of Islam. Mm -hmm. Islam means peace. And that's what actually Christianity is all about. Um, I'm, I'm still in my process. Mm -hmm. I don't say that you know, I know a lot about Christianity and about Islam. I still read and I still open-minded. Recently, I started learning about this faith called the Baha'i faith. Such a beautiful faith. It just became less than 200 years, actually. And it's gathered the Christianity, the Islam, and Judaism, and other religion in one faith. It's like gathering all faiths in one, in one faith. It's an amazing thing. And I keep open-minded always to learn more and to know more. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, do you think um, we should do more with teaching children about interfaith and religions other than their own? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the most thing that I will tell you about it. Don't understand me wrong, but if you go to Yemen and you start ask children about Christians and Jews, you might find like a shock response. Not because there's just like hate or something like that, it's just because ignorance. Because they don't know about it. But believe me, it's not only in, in Yemen, it's also in the United States. Mm -hmm. You go here and a lot of people like doesn't know anything about Islam, doesn't know anything about Christianity or Judaism. They think people who's acting bad, and they say they are believers, then they are believers. People who say, I know Jesus Christ, and they're acting as a Christian, they are not real Christians. Mm -hmm. Because they don't know anything about the faith if you ask them really about what Jesus Christ would do if he was in your situation. If Jesus Christ would do something different, then you know 100% that this person is a fake person. And he's not acting on the, f in the, in, on the background of the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I go here, I speak a lot about interfaith, and I feel a lot of ignorance still about it, especially about Islam. My name is Muhammad. I look like someone from Muslim's background. I go, I speak, and still, when I finish my speech, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of questions is shock to me. One person asked me, what's your, de what's, your, uh, what's your decision about ISIS? And when I saw such a question, it's like, what do you think? I would say, no, I like ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> it's just ignorance. And you think that ISIS is belongs to Islam? They don't, they don't belong to Islam. In each group, in any religion, you'll find a small group who is acting negatively in the name of the faith, mm -hmm. and they're not representing the faith. Mm -hmm. um, but for the kids, I love speaking to schools. Most of my speaking engagements, actually, I go to speak to schools and universities. I love enjoying actually speaking there. I feel like you know, I change their lives, I change their mind. I speak in places when people come to me, and kids, they come and they say, from today I will start reading the Quran. Mm. And so like, that's the most amazing thing. And people start telling me about their own like, you know, initiatives for interfaith. And that's what I want to create. And I feel like the United States is still missing a lot of curricular about interfaith and how important to know about each other. But again, uh, I hope this kind of things, mm -hmm. like the Abrahamic, uh, Abrahamic house, interfaith, and honestly, like what the cathedral also do, inviting Muslims, inviting Jews, inviting musicians, dancers, everyone to come to speak, that's actually what mm -hmm. we need to do. So we're coming towards the end of our time. Is there any one thing that you would like us all to take away this morning? I want you just to think about the people who helped me out. Daniel, Megan, Justin, and Natasha. They helped me out, and they were far away from me. They helped me out just because they believed on me. If you believe in something, you can do it. They helped me out. You know what they did? They reached actually senators. They reached the White House. And they're just four people, individuals. And they asked them, can you please help Mohammed, who's a Yemeni, who's not even American, to be evacuated? Many responded was no, 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 no. And in the end, they found the yes. And finally, they were able to do a military evacuation for me to escape from Aden. Imagine that these four people, just because believing on me, they were doing that. Believe in something, you can really change it. And also, I'm so happy about the differences between us. I'm happy about the diversity that between us. Mm -hmm. And mo the more important thing is that I'm happy that America is a land for refugees. And I hope that it will be like this where every refugee, everyone here in the room, you can tell it's from different background, different society, and they came and now they're Americans. And that's how America need to be all the time. It's sad that in Yemen, they were teaching us about the fake enemy, 
which is Christians, Jews, or whatever, different from us. And now, unfortunately, you hear in the media in America sometimes, it's immigrants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So everyone, everywhere, they want to create a fake enemy. And now it's, it's our own responsibility to actually ignore what they're trying to create a fake enemy and really focus on our own problems. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. So our official forum season begins on September the 15th. Do come back to hear Dean Malcolm Young talking with Representative Jackie Spear about surviving Jonestown and life in Washington, D.C. You are, of course, very welcome to join us upstairs for our 11 a.m. Eucharist. And um, we always keep the forum as a free event. If you're able to help support us in any way financially, we'd welcome any gifts. But finally, and most importantly, a great thank you to Mohammed. It's amazing to hear your story. You. It's wonderful to have you with us. And I hope that you will feel that we are part of your new American family. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you.